speaker tonight, Joseph Kearns. Joseph is president of Kearns and Associates. He has 30 years of experience in working with producers and suppliers, uh, a lot of mills as well to support agriculture operations. He leads a team of professionals uh, with the express purpose of understanding the financial parameters around uh, agriculture markets so that those that he works with can thrive and prosper. Uh, very well known to many of you. So, Joe, uh, we were looking forward to your presentation. So, thanks for having me and, and inviting me to join in here. So, the, the title of, of where do we go from here is kind of brought forth because of the perplexing times that we're currently in, and, and we find ourselves to be somewhat flat-footed, and that's understandable given the, given the parameters and the COVID environment and, and the shutdown of facilities. Uh, but my sub-point here is, is hearing the whispers amidst the protests. And, and when, when you take a look at the nightly news, I don't care if it's, uh, uh, I was recently in Philadelphia uh, w with a business trip and, and there's protests going on there. The Kenosha situation obviously has arisen here recently, uh, a little more closer to home. Uh, but, but, but we've got a lot of noise going on. And even, even as I was driving home tonight, uh, that whether you're a Joni Ertz fan or the Teresa Greenfield fan, it doesn't matter, but th this must be a tight race because the, the venom that's getting tossed back and forth as we go here, it's just kind of, it kind of occludes us. It kind of uh, uh, occupies our time. And inside that, I, I think there's a silent whisper, in, in, at least as the markets, my parallel here, is inside of what is happening with the markets. And there is a whisper of what to do. And I kind of want to start to address that. And um, uh, if you've missed the whisper, it's not your fault. It's the, the noise is just like a clanging gong right now that it's very, very de uh, easy to do so. Um, I am a licensed broker, and so therefore, uh, the, the disclaimer kind of generally says that if you take my advice and, and trade on it and, and don't make money, uh, that's, uh, that's at your own uh, accord here. Let's start off with what's going on on the grain side. And that's going to kind of set the stage for what profitability looks like rolling forward here. And, and to start with, uh, I've kind of highlighted this middle tier of a couple of counties in Iowa. Um, uh, I call it a Doratio. Uh, Jamie from uh, uh, the Pork Board calls it a Dorito. I'm not sure who's pronouncing this properly, uh, but we had an event here a couple of weeks ago that rushed across the state. Uh, across the state, it was incredibly damaging. You know, you know the equivalent of a, a Category One uh, hurricane or a Category One tornado, but the swath was unprecedented. And each county in Iowa was roughly uh, 25 miles wide, and so when you take a look at that, that's about 50 miles or so uh, about 30 percent of the total corn production in the state of iowa uh, fortunately for the guys the east side of the mississippi river they were largely spared they did have a little bit of down corn and some problems uh, in, into the west it just was kind of gathering steam uh, before it hit uh, those counties in western iowa but we're still in the process of trying to discover just how much damage was done what it looks like i'll be on a tour this weekend we've had uh, i was sharing earlier with the team is we had some folks in last night that are part of a crop tour. And this is gonna be kind of a recurring thing. You know, we, we missed the state fair. Uh, we missed the farm progress show. Uh, we didn't get our normal political thing in central Iowa. So finally, we have something that are bringing people into central Iowa. Uh, unfortunately, it's because of the destruction that occurred, uh, not only to the crops, but also to the property and the grain along the way. Uh, but this is largely the band where it occurred. Uh, what does that mean to us? Well probably not a whole lot, is uh, that if you take a look at the USD report that was just recently out and what it means, no, notice that with, with a few exceptions here that, that show some very pronounced increases, in general, we kind of tend to, uh, to kind of steady out here from the August crop to the final, with or without uh, the duration event. And why is that? Well, you know, the good to excellent ratings are almost like a beauty contest. When we get to June, everything is green, it's looking great, and, 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 and we get all optimistic and then summer sets in. And, and you're not going to believe this, guys, but sometimes it gets up to 90 degrees in the middle of Iowa, right, in the summertime. Well, of course it does, but then the crop doesn't look as good. And in my beauty pageant example, we start to decrease the good to excellent ratings as we roll forward here. Um, and that does tend to also, we get the most optimism from this August report. Now, this August report is taken by field, excuse me, not taken by field survey. It's farmer surveys. And so because of that, we've got this optimism 
that generally wanes as we roll forward here. So my prediction is, is that the numbers that we got from the USDA in the August report are probably the biggest numbers that we're going to get as far as production is concerned for the rest of the year. And when we take a look into the supply and demand side of it here, this is kind of what the table looks like. And, and we're gonna walk through this because I think it's important uh, in, the, uh, in, in the rear view mirror here of the duration event to try to talk about how are things lying up. Uh, you've got uh, the July and the August USDA estimates sitting in here. We had a very pronounced increase uh, from July to August of, of what the USDA was anticipating. You'll see my numbers are over there in the right-hand column. And this is where, as an analyst, you've got to make one of two choices. Did we wipe out those acres, and so I take it off of the harvested acres area, or am I going to include them and just de decline the yield per acre across the entire matrix? And that's what I've chosen to do here just to make things uh, kind of consistent and simple because it makes a point here, is even if you take my numbers here that are that are uh, uh, slightly less than the July report, very consistent with what the Pro Farmer Tour would show you, is that a disaster? No, guys, that's a record crop. That's a record yield that we're looking at. And sometimes I think that once we started off with this really, really high parameter, that we're going to be 185 or you know wh whatever number you want to conjure up, and suddenly it comes down to something that's reality, is we get disappointed. But the truth of the matter is, it will still be a record yield on a per acre basis. Now, once we start to, to multiply what are my harvested acres times what's my yield, that gets me production. And it's just a little bit less, if you can see my cursor right here, just a little bit less than a 15 billion bushel crop. That would not be a record simply because of the acreage, mind you. But let's kind of walk through this. This gives us a total supply uh, of, of 17 billion bushels or so. Now, let me, let me, let me kind of uh, add to that. Is that means we've got a store someplace in the neighborhood of 17 uh, billion bushels on or about October 1st of corn, and then we're going to actually add wheat and, co and soy back to that, we're going to tax our storage capacity because that wind didn't just take down corn, it took down storage capacity. And we're going to build another, uh, uh, we're going to make another crop next year. How quickly are we going to rebuild those uh, storage units? And whatever, the, whatever the answer is, it's not as quickly. I saw a stat the other day that was about 60 uh, million bushels uh, worth of uh, commercial storage that was impacting about three times that inside the private farm sector. And I think that's going to be a, a component to play with. Stay with me here just a little bit here. Uh, this this uh, feed and residual line got bumped up by the USDA. The biggest correlation to feed and residual is the size of the crop. So if I'm reducing the size of the crop, it makes sense that it also reduce the feed in residual line. The other one of interest, of course, is what's going on with ethanol. Ethanol right now is uh, uh, grinding about 90% of their maximum level. Uh, if you walk through the math on and find out what the maximum is, it's going to be about 93% according to the USDA. I'm not arguing that one whatsoever. And then again, what happens with this export line? And I, I think we're going to be relatively consistent. Here's the bottom line, guys. This ending stocks line, this bottom green line, is the governor of all trade. And we're going to, in my projections, uh, USDA says we're 2.7 billion bushel carryout with other reductions because of the wind event in Iowa. I think we're going to be someplace closer to 2.6 billion bushels. But from a pork producer standpoint, here's what's important. Take a look at this bottom line. Can you live with these numbers at roughly a, a 16, 17% carry out to use ratio? Can we live with that? Heck yes, we can. We can do this. To me, the biggest thing from the July to the August report is right down here on the bottom line. Take a look at that. We went from a $3.35 down to a $3.10, and that doesn't get talked about a lot, all right? When we take a look at a regression of where do we sit price-wise relative to the stocks to carry out use ratio, it's tough to get much tighter correlation than that. I think we are fairly priced where we sit right now in this. Uh, uh, this, this would have been the day of the report, would have been traded about $3.30 or so. Uh, certainly we've escalated from there, but let's give a little rounding here. These things don't happen in a straight line. They occur in band and we're certainly inside 
of that ban. When we take a look at our friends in the ethanol industry and what their fortunes look like, you can see what happened right down here in the COVID environment when they were producing to beat the band. Suddenly we stopped driving and the next thing you know, we got way too much ethanol on our hands. Prices plummeted and we actually took crude oil down to negative values. Since that point in time, profitability has bumped back up. That encouraged some plants to come back online. And now we're about mm, break even or so. And so as we sit right now, if you're a plant that's running, you probably don't have a lot of incentive to do anything other than continue running. And if you're a plant that's down, what are you going to do? You're probably going to stay down. And so I think we're at this really, really steady state. So amidst a lot of the, the turbulence and the turmoil is we found one thing that's going to be relatively constant, and that's what ethanol grind looks like. Here's what production is. That's going to match off very, very close or the inverse technically of what margins are. You saw the great big swoon uh, late, in, or excuse, late in the first quarter, early into the second quarter, and we've kind of progressed up just a little bit because of such. And what, what happened is, take a look at this peak right here. We physically ran out of room in order to store ethanol. And so as the stocks waned, it allowed us to come back online here just a little bit. And I think we're at a very, very steady state as far as ethanol price, or, uh, grind is concerned, which gives us DDG prices someplace in the $125 plus or minus level for an Iowa producers. And I just don't see that going too far. This is what December corn looks like. We rocked along and kind of hit this bottom about the time of the report. And when I start talking about whispers, this is the first one. And guys, right down here, the day of the report, when we got a relatively bearish report, and I wouldn't even call it a relatively bearish report, you had record yields. The first time we've ever printed 180 plus bushels to the acre coming out of the United States. And we had what's called a key reversal. We had a lower low, and I'm comparing these two lines. This might be a little too minuscule to see on the screen, but we had a lower low followed by a higher high. That's a key reversal. And that's a, a trigger for the funds to say, I need to buy this market. Well, the funds were short, roughly 200,000 contracts at that point in time. And you can see what's happened since is we've been on this nice little run up here. We're at, uh, trading at 352, 353 area right now. Technically, we could get up to this Fibonacci retracement value of 363 or so. Uh, but in the big scheme of life, I think we're starting to exhaust what this rally might look like. And I might change my mind once I'm on, uh, which I got a motorcycle tour, that I'm going on this weekend. And it might change your perspective, but I really don't think so. I think we're range bound between 350-ish, give me a little rounding error inside there, and 320, and we just don't move too far off of that. From a soy standpoint, here's what a balance sheet looks like. And again, the USDA bumped up going from July to August. What it looks like, I have kind of moderated those levels back again. Uh, but it really, I, I think we're in kind of a steady state as we go. It's a little more tenuous on the U.S. soy supply and demand. But notice I said U.S. And, and there's a reason for that here. But I'll, and I'll get to that here in a moment. Here's what we've got. We've got someplace in the neighborhood of a 500 million bushel carryout. That would give me an 11% stocks to use ratio and kind of this, uh, this shrug type of scenario here. This is what the regression looks like. Remember the corn was sitting right on top of the regression line. And yet here we are trading futures a little bit below the regression line. Why is that? Uh, that has everything to do with the world situation is the Brazilian REI has, uh, uh, has weakened versus the dollar by about 36% year over year. The Argentinian peso has done the same thing. I was in Argentina about this time last year, and we were trading a 60 to 1 uh, peso to U.S. dollar. By, uh, just by complete coincidence, I've been to Argentina on or about December 1st, the last two years in a row. And two years ago, it was trading at about 40 to 1. Last year is about 60 to 1, so a 50% spread in between those numbers, and now it's, it's moved out to 73 to one. So it's about another 33% spread. My point is this, we're providing the South Americans every single incentive necessary in order to plant as much as they can. And their planting season is about three weeks away. So there's a little bit of a bump up in the board here that you've seen, uh, don't hit the panic button. All we're doing is supplying a world scenario with enough supply in order to make it. And that's why, because of this world situation, is that we're trading prices in the United States slightly less than where they otherwise would have been. 
The big story uh, in the soy side of it is export sales to China. A lot of, of conjecture about uh, them meeting the phase one commitments, and certainly the soy side of it has been the biggest beneficiary. Uh, this five-year average might be slightly misleading because it's going to have 2017 and 2018 in there. Uh, 1819 and, and 1819 was was just absolutely dismal, and so we've had some real clinkers inside the last five years uh, that might start to to make this skew just look a little bit better. Barring that, make no mistake, we've got so a really nice advance in new crop sales. Uh, generally, we're in this very rhythmic pattern where the Brazilians sell a whole bunch of stuff during during our downtime and then, and then we reciprocate. Notice this blue line. This blue line is Brazil. The orange line is the United States. And we're starting to ramp this one back up as Brazil is falling back down. Bottom line, guys, we're the only game in town for soy. So don't be hugely surprised when you see some exports coming our way. When we take a look at pricing, notice that we're right up on top of that Fibonacci retracement number sitting here at this 922 level against November soybeans. If you are a producer of beans, I would highly encourage you to think hard about where your next sale is going to be. And even as we roll over into 2021, I want you to think really, really hard about what another uh, uh, 6% acreage in Brazil and the same in Argentina might mean to our values. Now, keep in mind, uh, a 6% increase in their production equals about an 18 to 20% increase in their exports. Their domestic use stays relatively static. So that's all coming down around your shoulders. That's something to think about. As an end user, I think you're in pretty good shape. You probably don't need to do much. And even if you do do something, it's only through March of 2021, which is enough time to let South America harvest whatever they're going to do. So here's kind of our grain conclusions. Is even a couple hundred million bushels of loss in the state of Iowa. And I, I got to tell you, I put a plate in the air today uh, that when you fly over that area, it looks devastating. When you drive along that area, I happen to live in this region, is it's also very, very devastating. So even with all that said, I think, not, not think, I'm very certain that we've got enough stuff, uh, uh, i.e. corn in the bins in order to make it from year to year. We are human beings, we trade on emotion, and I think we're getting just a freckle emotional at this point in time in the corn market. Uh, the future crop genetics, as long as we keep a price above 30, 330, is going to be, we are going to see more corn acres come in. And so I, I want you to pay attention to what, uh, once we get to February specifically, uh, when the insurance payments are coming on, of what the December futures are trading at, and it's certainly higher than the 350 right now. We've got very, very wide carries in the market. Brazilian production looks like it's going to be up, uh, and that's what I was sharing earlier, that, uh, that their, their exports are a higher percentage than their production simply because their domestic use doesn't work and it's kind of the, uh, the, the denominator factor here. Uh, soybean meal futures are attractive to me, kind of once we get down to this 280-ish, the United States is the only place to go, all right? Chinese appetite's been good, and I want to caution anybody that wants to get really, really bullish to soy based on China. As pork producers, have we learned anything about how China might bail us out of an excess supply situation? And I'll just kind of leave that one hanging for a moment because it doesn't work very well. When we swap over to the pork side, this is my picture from last night. I've got a Traeger grill and I was uh, putting bacon on it and, and trying to discover whether a perforated type of environment or a kind of a jelly pan up here uh, would produce the best yields. And no matter what you look at, when you look over here on the right hand side, uh, it was fantastic. It's BLT season. I've got a big garden sitting out behind me here uh, and it's, uh, it, it worked out really well. So anybody that has a Traeger, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. By the way, this rack was the best one once you get it off the direct heat uh, as we go. Big argument right now. Are we current? No, we are not. Does this remind you of the political side of it, right? right? We're going we're gonna to take two opposing views of the market when we take a look at this pork side of it. And, and where you sit might determine your perspective. And I'm trying to be a little agnostic on this one and just try not get emotional about it. But let, let's kind of take a look at both sides of, of, of the argument here. Uh, the hope and change thing worked for the Obama administration, right? He got him elected to two terms into office there about, about offering this hope. And perhaps that's what the market is doing. And we've got some evidence 
from those on the, on the, that particular front here. There's a, a nearly a $50 topside today in the cash, up a solid $10 from the recent lows, even 10 days ago from there. The weights are low, and there might be some explanations to this, certainly the seasonality. This is the time we hit our low light on the weights here. We've had plenty of heat in here, the, the lack of ractomian in the rations and the impact of the whole diet and what that looks like probably all contribute inside here. <clears throat> when we take a look at federal inspected slaughter, we are up 1.2% with production up 2.1. Who would have guessed that? After our COVID situation and we backed off all the kill for that level, it doesn't feel that way, but the math doesn't lie, right? But even with all that said, is we've got the cutout is down 9% from a value standpoint. And anybody that's priced out the cutout certainly knows that. Uh, and it doesn't feel all that great, but it's a heck of a lot better than what's going on in any negotiated market. It's down a whopping 43% for the year. And so the question to be answered, if you're in this camp of we are current, is where did the pigs go? And I've, I, I've read and, and heard of, of many explanations, none of which totally satisfied me, mind you, of, of, well, they went out to Connecticut. Well, sure, a few truckloads did. Well, we euthanized a, a whole bunch to make room for them. Okay, that, that I can buy off on a little bit of that. But none of them can make up for the backlog that we saw in the June hogs and pigs report. And I'll get to that here in a moment about what that one looks like. And so my answer on this one is it depends. How's, how's that for politically correct? And it depends largely on where you're located. And this is kind of what uh, I broke it. We, we normally call a Western Corn Belt an Eastern Corn Belt. I tried to do just a little bit better than that in calling it this Far East Corn Belt because I think that plays a role. And when we started to clean things up, this Eastern Corn Belt, in my opinion, was the first whisper in the market that we are clean. We saw some bids coming from those Eastern processors uh, that we didn't see for any other market. It then converted over into the Western Corn Belt that sure appears to be clean. But it's this one over here, this eastern side, and specifically the big plant sitting out there in North Carolina that's been behind schedule, hasn't been able to catch up, and the backlog of hogs might be regionally displaced. And so the, 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 the both sides might be right of, yes, we have a, a backlog of hogs, and yes, my local market is current, right? So, so let's, let's kind of hold those two things as both possibly being true. But arguing over where we are is never as important, in my opinion, as where we're going. And this is where I think things start to get just a little bit sticky. This is generated by Dr. Steve Meyer in our office. That red line represents what packing capacity was at this time last year, this 2.755 million. The green horizontal line represents what it is in a COVID environment at 95% of our kill rate. You'll notice that it's about 2.621. I'm going to put my cursor kind of just where we sit right now, this last portion of August. We've got Labor Day coming up, which obviously will give us a bit of a contraction in what the kill looks like. But notice the general slope of the line is going to start to move higher here. And so whatever you think we are, whether we're current or we're behind, we are either going to get behind or more behind, in my opinion, rolling forward. If you just take the data from the June hogs and pigs report at face value, this is what it looks like coming into that. At the June hogs and pigs report, we had about 2.5 million head kill uh, backed up. Uh, kind of fast forward to today, right about here, they would show about 1.8. We're about 500,000 less than that, our internal numbers. We'd say it's about 1.3 million head that are backed up, and most of those are in the Carolinas. Uh, that's not my point. My point is, is the slope of whatever we are moves in a very adverse direction for the pork production community as we go forward here. There's a lot of things I don't know, guys. Here's what I am pretty certain of, that Christmas falls on a Friday, as does New Year's. That means coming into the Christmas week, we're going to kill Monday, Tuesday, maybe a half a day Wednesday, perhaps a half a day Thursday, and then we're going to go dark Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And that's what this is all about. That's not about production over on this right-hand portion of the chart. That's not about production. That's about the holiday falling at the worst possible time when we have a lot of animals coming at us and a constriction in the kill schedule here. When we take a look at the demand side of it, it is, it, it's erratic right here. Uh, this top 
portion of the chart is when the beef cutout went. By the way, this is uh, this is pork, chicken, and beef all combined together here. And so once we had the pork cutout really, really spike in in the height of our COVID environment, that's what that looks like. It has since fallen back down. And if you're kind of taking average of it, maybe it kind of moderates, but it's just been so incredibly volatile that it's been very difficult to predict on a, uh, with any confidence interval. When does the pain go over? This is courtesy of uh, the folk from Rabobank, Christine there. Uh, they're not seeing it until mid to late 2022. So even if we want to hold out this hope, you're going to have to hold your breath for a while, and you're going to have to have a banker that's hanging with you and a pricing program for your animals that's going to allow you to at least to survive that long. When we take a look at the export market, China's certainly been the, been the, the stalwart in this one. Uh, uh, Chinese exports year over year undeniably high. However, there's a troubling trend going on. China was 11% of our total production, and that's slowly whittled down to 5%, while most other countries year over year because of the COVID environment by and large are lower on our export. doesn't mean we're losing market share. They're just not taking as much stuff as we go forward. When we take a look at the sow herd, in my opinion, at the bare minimum, if we've got 95% uh, packing capacity, that would certainly mean that we've got to get rid of 5% of the sows just to accommodate the slower harvest. Logistically, I think it's got to be a bigger number because if you've got a very highly productive unit, you're probably not taking it out of production. So therefore, from a numerical value, we've got to take more animals out of production, right? Longer term, when you take a peek under the covers of the genetics companies, we're not stopping on this growth curve, guys. We're going to keep on getting bigger and better as we roll forward here. As a matter of fact, if we wouldn't have a COVID environment, we're going to have our production up 4% this year alone off of a sow herd that might have been up one to one and a half percent. That's a really good thing. You're in a growth industry that unfortunately has some constrictions associated with it that are just kind of eating in for our profitability. So do we need to reduce? Yes, right? We've got to do that in order to right this ship going forward. So what's about this flatten the curve? Well, Dr. Fauci has suddenly been absent, so you've got Dr. Joe in order to help you. And I'm just going to pick out this green line here. Is This is what we would normally expect, right? Is we get a summertime that moves up a little bit and then it kind of goes back down. Is that what demand looks like? Not at all. That's because of lack of supply that we get the higher prices here. And when we take a look out to the 2021 futures, we still have this rhythm in place where we've got higher prices in the summertime and lower prices in the fall. But let's take a look at something else here. If we seasonally index the pork price, is what you discover is that this yellow, excuse me, this orange line, which is the pork cutout side of it, actually has higher demand from an economist standpoint, which is, which is disappearance at a price than we do in the summer. You still get a higher price in the summer because we have fewer hogs, but demand is actually higher in the fall than it is. I'm gonna round this back together here and kind of bring these thought processes into full play here in a moment. Our slaughter forecasts are still very large. Uh, this is numbers, again, this is Dr. Myers numbers. I want you to be very, very careful here. We're talking about million ahead USDA is talking about billions of pounds. So when you take a look at the percentages and say, wait a second, that doesn't match off, be very, very careful uh, therein. Uh, we see a little bit of an increase this year, uh, a little bit more of an increase next year, and that is certainly not slowing us down enough on a head count in order to accommodate for some of the constrictions that we've had in the pork production side of it, excuse me, in the packing side of it here. Uh, the, the 2020 price is uh, certainly going to be lower. And when we take a look out right now at what our futures prices versus what our demand model looks like for prices, there's a pretty good discrepancy, probably 20 to $25 a pig discrepancy. And that's, that's nothing to sneeze at, guys, is the futures market is still building in that what we worry, we're going to get back to normal. We're going to see some profitability in 2021. Our numbers are a little more conservative than that, of thinking that we're going to stay in this quagmire a little longer uh, based on the uh, uh, food service situation that I shared with you from that Rabobank slide. And I just don't think things get too much better here. 
This last portion of the time that we're going to have together, I'm going to talk about something else here. It's because we're, we're having a difficult time. And when I entitled my speech, what are we going to do? I think there is actually an opportunity to own your own future. And, we're, and we've started this. Uh, the, the, the Minnesota 308B Cooperative, we hear a lot of 401Ks or, or, or other uh, 501C3 uh, portions of the tax law. To familiarize yourself with this, this Minnesota 308B is a cooperative that the Capra Volset Act of 1922 allows collective bargaining to agricultural entities specifically. We are forming one, the original concept, and, and when I say we, it's a group of, of folk. I just happen to be affiliated with it. The original concept was to find some other way in order to provide you some hedge monies that don't come out of Mark Greenwood's pocket. Uh, uh, it's more sense then here. Uh, the establishment of the co-op allows the members to free access to production practice. Here's what it does not allow. You can't collude. You can't enter into an agreement of everybody cut back 10 to 15 percent just to increase the price. Supply management is illegal no matter what your charter looks like. So that I, I want to be very, very clear. However, it does allow collective bargaining. This might be one of the better benefits that the collective we, if we all had uh, 10,000 head we are marketing, we might not have a whole lot of power, but if you put 100 of us together, suddenly now we've got a critical mass that we can go to the market and actually find uh, a way in order to get some attention. The eventual goal of this whole thing is an Uber of market hogs, and stay with me on this. Imagine this, is that we've got a group of producers all coordinated that you know what the size of animals are in every barn. You've got some packing agreements that are kind of stratified against the geographic area. And now we're moving the proper animals into the proper slot. Eventually, I think that's where we go. That's several years down the line, and I'm not trying to pretend it's ready to go. The software is ready to go, I'll tell you that. Uh, our ability to execute on it is down the road. But I just want to kind of toss that out uh, as, as a portion of hope here for what does this look like here. Um, the, the, the Department of Justice recently uh, issued against a co-op system that you cannot uh, uh, engage in predatory or coercive practices to stifle competition. So again, the Capra Volstead is a powerful act, but it is not the end all of everything. All right, so let's put a bow on this. And I try to divide this into what do we think we know versus what we're pretty sure we don't know. And what I think I know is the Chinese hog prices are staying high. They're, they're astronomically higher, 6X plus uh, prices. It, pr price of hogs in China doesn't matter anymore. Their production is increasing, stimulated by the increase in price. And uh, uh, you, you can hear all kinds of anecdotal as well as evidential components that will support that. Uh, trust, how about this, how about this? I truly believe that by 2022, this whole China thing that we've been banking on is going to be over. Uh, if you were betting the farm that ASF someplace else was going to uh, bring you nirvana, I think we watched that one kind of squiddle down our leg here. Uh, exports to most countries are predictable. The US is holding on to some market share. The problem is, is that people just aren't doing too many. Uh, we've got way too many pigs, and, and we're going to have to do something soon. Uh, I want you to convert your thought process in the way we think of this. And again, this supports my flatten the curve idea, is that our shackle space capacity is the component that dictates what pork production looks like, not the price of pig, excuse me, not the supply of pig. And that's from, uh, oh, I suppose for a brief time in 1998, we were in this similar scenario. None of us want to go relive that again. But in general, our supply of pigs gives us what supply looks like, not shackle space capacity, and that's what we look like. That's what we're looking at right now. Demand component, I don't see coming back to us anytime soon here. Uh, and the forward curve says I can hold it together for 2021. And you as a pork producer have a choice of whether or not you say yes to that or not. Uh, peeking under the covers, as I alluded to earlier, uh, from genetic components, we are going to increase productivity. And this one, this one might surprise you a little bit, is I would contend we're going to lose packing capacity before we gain it. Uh, the plant in the Carolinas that recently came back online after being fabricated for Chinese export business exclusively was specifically stated, if we have to do that, we'll shut it down. Well, because of some difficulty in processing on the eastern seaboard, 
that didn't happen. Don't don't think that, that if things get back to some level of normalcy uh, that we might lose a packing plant uh, be, between now and then. What are we pretty sure, pretty sure we don't know this political thing? I opened up with that. Uh, what was the political bantering going back and forth right now is going to fill your airwaves from now through early November. Uh, I get pretty nauseated from it. Uh, but what does it mean for agriculture? I, I don't know. What, what's it mean for the value of the dollar or exports? Uh, you've got the Democratic candidate that's come out and said that he would ease the restrictions upon the, uh, the Chinese uh, tariffs. Maybe that'll help agriculture. I don't know. I, all I know is I'm terrible at this political things and the political ramifications are going to be very, very impactful here and impact what's going on with China. Um, and the last thing I'd, I'd give you is notice we've stopped talking about ASF. And I find that very, very troubling because the, the opportunity is just as prevalent and would have negative ramifications on that 2021 curve uh, while we've got some opportunity to at least break even and maybe show some, some light green numbers. And with that, I would take any questions that we might have. Well, an optimum market weight continues to be a debate. Integrators are very reluctant to decrease weight where many independent producers believe that they can save money by reducing market weights. Is it really cost effective to reduce market weights? And in a leverage volume business, does it really make sense to lower the market weights? I, I love this question. And I would, I would say absolutely not lowering market weights. Uh, that we are going, that the throughput capacity of a packer is determined by how many pounds he can put on each shackle that roll through at a prescribed rate. If we index our production units based on their same revenue side, the answer is let's optimize the system in general. I understand the short term economics might not take a peek at that, but long term, I think we've got to be taking a look at, at what makes sense for the entire system. And, and if you happen to have read my National Hog Farmer article this weekend, I was talking about that, about how we price our animals. I'm a huge advocate of cutout pricing, not just because it's the, it's the higher of the options right now, but I think that, that getting parallel with what the packers are receiving and having that pass through back to the production things. Listen, guys, I'm a homer for the, for the producers here. I, I want them to win, but I also think that we've got to be very, very realistic in how we're going about this. And giving the packers what they want so they can make money is going to transcend into us making money. So to, to me, uh, th this is an undeniable truth. And again, I'm going I'm to circle back to the genetic side of it here, Colin, is when you take a look at, at what are our genetic, what's the... Um, uh, the efficiency of an animal at 300 pounds now versus 20 years ago, it's unquestionable. Is we are still, you know, we're pushing out that physiological maturity to a point where we're still converting relatively well at even these, what we consider to be heavier weights. And I suspect that it's going to be some infrastructure issues that, that start to back us off, i.e. I can only engineer so much weight carrying capacity within a plant, but I would absolutely be an advocate of heavier weights over time, even though the micro situation might say differently. Yeah, good, good, good answer to that. Hey, related to some of these market weights and just the volume of product that's out there and, and coming forward, you, uh, you talked about crop production, grain production in South America. What about their protein sector? Um, what's that do to insights on our markets? Uh, the, the protein sector, I don't see expanding at the same rate. The uh, the the money required. Now, keep in mind, if you spend any time in Brazil whatsoever and take a look at the land that's being brought back into production, we're not clearing the Amazon rainforest. I, I often reference it as as Manhattan, Kansas type of ground with some character to it, and, and it has everything you need. You've got fertility, you've got sunshine, and you've got uh, predictable rains. And it's simply a matter of getting the economics in place in order to sometimes change the pH of the soil in order to bring product back into or bring land back into production. That incentive still remains the same. Um, uh, the economic instability and the inflation levels inside of both Brazil and Argentina, so combine those, I'm calling those South America, mean that it's very difficult from an infrastructure standpoint or from a finance standpoint in order to pump money into a pork production unit. Ask yourself this right now, that if you're to lay down 10,000 sows, you know, what is your net return? I saw some statistics today. It's basically zero. We're in a zero profit environment. We, we executed a, a, a 10 year bullet swap yesterday for 0.6%. 
We're in a zero inflation rate environment and we can't make ends meet. And when you're at a, a, a 30 or 40 percent inflation rate environment, regardless, uh, you can't you can't make ends meet. My point is this. Opening up land is a lot more economically feasible and directly one for one. You're, you're selling in U.S. dollars. You're buying in your local currency. Uh, the 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 production animal production side is very very different. I don't see it following at the same pace. The 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 incentive eventually will come into play, but that is not our acute uh, uh, situation right now. Uh, another question. I'm an independent producer who uh, utilizes 100% of my uh, corn crop uh, as far as my APH. I've wiped out uh, well over 50%, maybe more of that uh, two weeks yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh, what's the plan going forward for me? All right. So uh, it's still a little ambiguous about how you're going to be compensated from your loss. The governor today was indicating that we had $100 million coming from a $4 trillion fund from the U.S. side of it that will be allocated out to producers. Here's the really disappointing part with me. You're talking about $10,000 increments. And if you've got any scope or scale, it's, the $10,000 isn't gonna go very far. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna separate this into two different buckets. I can't, I can't handicap nor predict, nor do I wish to the political side. The market side of it says to you uh, that you've got these huge carries in the market and any good bull market is characterized by inverses. We are not in a bull market right now. So I'd be uh, that if you can store corn, if, you, if you've wiped out your crop, if you've got physical bins available, I'd buy as much as I could at harvest, hedge it up against the December, sell it in the forward months against the July as your protection, and start to pretend that you're a grain elevator at this point that doesn't have any production at your avail. Uh, your, uh, the, the grain side of it is not going to be your nemesis, whether you're producing your own or having to buy it in the commercial market, we are going to stay relatively competitive, i.e. $3.25 plus or minus across the entire corn belt. Um, you're just going to have to play a little bit of a different game and, and my heart goes out to you for the crop loss. I, I, I've driven by it and just sighed in, inside the truck. Mm -hmm. um... Let me make sure this question or a comment, but I'll read it. We have found that the Japanese could import pork more cost effective than producing it domestically, obviously. Uh, probably the same for China, but will the national pride interfere with their imports? Yeah, you've got you've got two different uh, you might have two different Asian nations, uh, but but you've got two very, very different systems here. The Japanese, I think, have accurately uh, ascertained that their uh, lack of land mass is better utilized for something else, i.e. making cars or a higher value type of, of uh, item and, and exporting it back and then importing the lower priced uh, items where the land mass in the United States can more efficiently produce things. I don't think that changes whatsoever. Um, I've been to China a half a dozen different times. Uh, I am thoroughly convinced we are not going to out negotiate the Chinese, nor are they going to allow themselves to be put into a compromising position of weakness. They have specifically stated that uh, the production of protein to feed their people is uh, something that's very important to them. I don't think we're going to see the same. We're not going to see the same transition. The economics are undeniable that they quote should be importing our pork as well as the Europeans, as well as the Brazilians. Uh, but they won't do it. Don't hang your hat on China to be the savior, even though every single piece of logic says that's the case. Feel free, everyone, to, to chat some more questions. It's another comment that there's a lot of educators preaching a lot of reducing weight as, a, as being an industry concern. So uh, I know you hear that a lot, Joe. Yeah. I'd say, wait, wait uh, obviously it's hot outside. Uh, next week we're going to cool off this. You know, I pointed out this lack of paling is a huge issue in my point. And I don't get paid by Elaine Co. or anybody else to, to say this, but we as pork producers have mitigated one of our most valuable molecules that we've ever had in the history of pork production and don't have it at our avail. I think that's just a, a shame. Uh, we, we did it from an altruistic standpoint about wishing to be competitive in a foreign market, specifically uh, China. And, and even though that's sustaining us right now because of their production woes, long term, I think we're going to really, really regret 
um, uh, the lack of availability of that of that product. And we started working on that in the 60s, Eli Lilly did. Yes, we did. Yep. So I will remind everyone we've got uh, last week's uh, recording of the um, uh, evaluating the hog supply agreement. We had uh, Jim Hughes from CIH. That recording will be coming out shortly, so stay patient. Get that posted in the next week. And uh, Joe's recording tonight will be available as well. Um, Hedging targets for early 2021. What do you think? I think we're kind of sitting there. Uh, you've got these summer futures trading up to 75 or so. You've had a little bit of a bump even in the current nearby stuff into this 55. Uh, uh, I, I would be sloughing stuff off, uh, and depending upon your pricing mechanism. And again, I'm a huge fan of the cutout. If you've got a basis contract, this is a no-brainer, in my opinion. Uh, that you you really start to lay in at these levels. I don't think that you wait in order to things might get better, but we start participating now. Um, if you are a medium or even large producer, getting up enough volume might be difficult. Uh, a smaller producers, even mid-sized producers, if you want to uh, put a plan together that says over the next week or so, here's my goal. It's a very very doable. Item and in Colin, one thing I didn't talk about, at least in this presentation, um, is in that I wrote about my National Hog Farmer article, is that it certainly appears that we're going to have a cutout contract that's going to be available to us very, very soon. And I'm a huge fan of that for a myriad of reasons. Um, I, I, I can talk more than than my allotted time uh, about why I think we're going there. But we, as a pork production community, um, have an opportunity to band together to essentially eliminate the Iowa, Southern Minnesota, Western Corn Belt as a marker market and, and move closer to what the packer is receiving. And it might feel like you're dancing with the devil just a little bit, but I'll tell you, you might want to dance with the devil because your next partner doesn't look any more attractive than that. Good point. Good point. Um, you didn't mention, excuse me, you didn't mention Russia as a world supplier. I think they will ever get there. No, no, you've got, I mean, you've got um, uh, Russia that has, uh, that calls themselves self-sufficient simply because they, they uh, 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 mitigate their supply to meet uh, you know, you know, their current populace by disallowing importation. Uh, Russia from a supply point is probably the greatest promise that China is from a demand point that will never occur in our lifetimes here. Um, I just don't see it. You know, you know if you and, and I've never physically been to Russia, but but have talked to several that have. The productivity of the land would certainly uh, lead you to believe that they could be, uh, you know, the Iowa, uh, Illinois of uh, that, you know, the, that eastern portion of the world. Yet the the political structure and the finance structure probably never never see it coming into fruition in a way that that um, uh, strongly impacts. What we see the the ASF uh, prevalence is, is going to deny them exports to the world. I just don't see that one being the biggest threat on the on the radar right now. Yeah, yeah. Here's a question I they were probably typing before you even answered this, but you address this on paleine. But it says rectopamine was discontinued to sell variety meats to Chinese. Yep. Have we fooled ourselves? And, and you were spot on with that, Joe, saying yeah. we, we really cheated ourselves out of that product. <sighs> Yeah. It, it, it really frustrates me. Yeah, yeah. You know, this all started back in 2005 when uh, the United States uh, basically punted uh, a, a WTO dispute with Thailand, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, China hopped on the back of that. And so well, it's good for Thailand. It's good for us if you're not going to fight it. We, we, in hindsight, you know, 15 years removed, should have fought that one pretty hard. When will we truly have a better outlook on uh, on the grain supply in the states? Well, the, the September report will uh, start the first week of SEP, and it's actually an objective report that you'll get folk, USDA folk out in the field. Uh, that'll come out the second week of September. I think that's going to give us a really, <clears throat> excuse me, a really, really good feel for just how much corn has been lost. Um, uh, that, that Even if you take all the Iowa acres and take, all, we, we did this in exercise in our office, 
all the poor to very poor acres and put them to zero. Uh, push that back against Iowa yield, that comes out to about 180. And when you push that against the national yield, it comes out to 178 bushels to the acre, which is you know half a bushel off of what I gave you in a spreadsheet. Uh, I don't think we're going to get any worse than that. Uh, I'm, I might change my mind after this coming weekend, uh, but, but I'm very confident that the September report will catch uh, the downed corn specifically uh, that we've got and, and try to uh, push that back through the numbers in order to let us give uh, some, some real numbers, objective data to trade from, not just, oh my God, that looks bad. Uh, probably one final question here. Will a cutout contract on the CME lead Packers to offer more cutout contracts? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a great question. And and if we only give them the option of offering a cutout contract, they've got no place to run or hide. Yeah. Over the past several years, whether you've got a Western Corn Belt or someone's bid you on a cash market that does not populate the, the market that you're priced off of, those have been techniques that have been utilized. And if we start to eliminate the ways that we can have deviancy, uh, within the pricing structure and only put it against a cutout contract, it absolutely will satisfy what we need to do. And I'm a huge advocate of running headstrong toward that. Um, I think as a producer, you've got to take a look as an us against them type of mentality simply because your back's against the wall. We want to be Iowa nice all the time. And this is no time to be Iowa nice. It's you your future, the future of your family farm, is resting upon this decision, and I do not take that lightly. Yeah, yeah, no, great perspective. So, uh, appreciate all the insights tonight, Joe. I want to thank you for taking your time to do it, put some slides together. Uh, again, your contact information is in front of folks. Uh, take that down quickly, or uh, feel free to share the recording once it will be posted to the Pork Industry Center website. Thank you to the Iowa Pork Produce Association for helping facilitate this and organize speakers and, and the thought process going into it. We understand a lot of the needs that are out there associated with just a lot of constraints this year and going forward as well. So thank you for being everyone tonight and stay safe. God bless. All right. Have a good night. Good night.